And now, for the week of June 5th, Adobe Photoshop TV is on the air. Welcome to Adobe Photoshop TV from the National Association of Photoshop Professionals. And here's your host, the Photoshop Guys, Scott Kelby, Dave Cross, and Matt Pluskowski. Welcome, everyone, to another semi-nude episode of Adobe Photoshop TV brought to you by NAP, the National Association of Photoshop Professionals, the people behind Photoshop User Magazine. They were nice to have us here because why I'm their president. <laughs> and this episode is sponsored by... This episode is sponsored by Strata, Yellow Machine, DLO, iStock Photo, and the fine, fine folks at b and Photo. Our friends at b and Photo, the greatest places where we buy all our gear. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Scott Kelby, and joining me on the set is Mr. Felix Nelson. Hello there. Felix is the creative director for NAP and for Photoshop User Magazine and for Layers Magazine and for Nikon Software User Magazine and for a whole bunch of other things. But we're very happy to have him here because Matt and Dave just aren't. Where, where are those slackers? Those slackers <laughs> are still out west. They are, uh, Matt was just coming back now from a trip. He was out west, out at Adobe's headquarters. Dave was out there doing the power tour, right? Yeah, he had cheese land last time in Milwaukee. Yes, somewhere. he was yeah, out there yeah. in Milwaukee last week, and now he's on to another city. We don't really know we where. We don't know where he's at. But uh, we do have the Canadian flag. We are flying that. It's right here in honor of him right there. So, uh, welcome everyone. We've got a great show put together for you. We have a special guest today. We've got reports from Matt on the road, interviews. Right. Uh, we've got Dave Cross is uh, going to be doing a tip from afar. But we're starting with a tip from me. That's right. I brought a tip for you. It is a CS tip or a CS2 tip, whichever one you want. But if you have Photoshop 7, this tip is not for you. <laughs> it is a tip on how to create a very realistic depth of field effect. Now, a very simple de depth of field effect would be to make your foreground in focus and just make everything in the background right. out of focus. But what this is going to do is actually ba basically give you a little more control by using the lens blur filter. So it's gradually going back. Not that crazy lens blur filter. Yes, that Settle crazy down, lens so blur filter, baby. Here we go. So here's the photo here. What I want to do is I want to leave her in focus. And as we go further away here, I want things to become much, much more out of focus. So we're going to go to the channels palette right here. And you know I love channels. So we're going to add a channel. And where I'm adding a channel so I don't hurt the, any of these channels here. So we're going to add an extra channel by clicking on the new channel icon right here at the bottom of the now, channels Are you really good at channels? Have, is, is, have you ever like written a book or anything about channels? I mean, I, I just, just asking. Wow, Felix, thanks. As a matter <laughs> of fact, I have. But anyway, that's not what this is about. But uh, thank you. Here's 20 bucks. Okay. Uh, we're going to we have created my new channel. We're going to work on this channel. I'm not changing channels, but I need to be able to see the photo. So I'm going to click on the eyeball only right beside that so I can see through my little red kind of rubolith overlay what's going on back there. So now I get the gradient tool right here in the toolbar. I make sure that I've got the third gradient in the default set, which is the black to white gradient. I drag from what I want to be in focus to what I want to be out of focus like that. And see how it kind of creates a little gradient in your alpha channel? All right, we can hide that alpha channel. Let's click back on the RGB and switch back over to layers. All right, because we kind of done what I needed to do, which was create the layer, drag the gradient. Pretty simple stuff. Now we go into the filter menu under blur to lens blur, which brings up this giant dialog box. What you want to make sure that you do here is choose alpha. Now, by default, it shows you not the alpha channel whatsoever. You want to turn on preview. And, of course, when you turn on preview, you're going to go, oh, man, the whole thing's blurry. The key to this is going under depth map, under source, and choosing alpha one. That's the channel you created. And look at that. See how it's sharp here, and then it goes blurry there? That's not All right? bad. Not and you bad. can control this blur focal distance, too. What's, so you can, if you want, like, well, you know, in a real, normally, depth of field in a real camera, you have a third of the image in front is, is out of focus and two-thirds in back. But in this case, you can decide where, how, where that point is by dragging it up. So you can see now it's kind of sharp over here. It's blurry on this side and on that side. So we went a little too far. Let's bring it back here. Now, I'm going to show you a little trick a lot of people don't know, that once you get the blur focal distance the way you want it, where she's in focus, if you were to click the, your cursor just over here, it then makes that area in focus. So you can decide really where you want your focal point. It just kind of moves the gradient for you. When you get it like you like it, click OK, and it applies that to the image. So look at, here's a before and after. I'm going to just do a, a Command Z or MPC Control Z to show you before and after. So she stays in focus, and it goes gradually blurrier and blurrier from here 
on out. But not only does it just do that, but the lens blur, I think, gives you a more realistic blur than the Gaussian blur. It looks more like a real, a real photographic blur than you'd get, which the Gaussian blur kind of looks very Gaussian. That's pretty good. You, know, you ought to think about doing this for a living. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was thinking that. about that. All right. Well, there you go. There's a little quickie on a lens blur. But, of course, our guest, Mr. Nelson, here has brought something for us. I have. but I, Well, it's not a tip, per se. It is more of a, if it's, it's an illustration. It's actually a logo that we designed for the cover of Photoshop User Magazine for a feature that Dave Cross had actually written uh, on, the, uh, on taking the ACE boot camp test, or the ACE uh, certification test. Yeah, the Adobe's. ACE certification, by the way, if you don't know what that is, that's the Adobe Certified Expert Correct. Program, which Correct. they use ACE for short, which is kind of very right. clever. So we wanted to do a, a whole, almost a military kind of a, a brass emblem kind of a, a, a illustration for it. So here we go. Here's how we do it. All right, first of all, we actually created this logo, this, uh, the vector art in Illustrator, and we brought it into Photoshop as a vector, a smart, uh, smart object. So we're going to take that. The first thing we want to do is add a small drop shadow around it. So you, you drew that first. Correct. Okay. We drew this in Illustrator and imported it as a smart object into Photoshop. So we're going to add a small drop shadow to it. Can I ask a question before you go on? I'm sorry. I don't you mean certainly to can. You, but it doesn't have to be a smart object, does it? You it doesn't have to be a smart object. Okay, it can so be, if you have CS2, this will work just the same. Absolutely, sure. If you have CS2, it can be any, you can do it on any layer. We just actually prefer to work in Illustrator at the time and bring it in as a smart object so we can resize it and raster it you know, at, at, at different But you don't, different it doesn't sizes. have to be a smart object. Absolutely not. It can be any layer. You can, be, you can do this on any layer that's not a smart object. So okay, good. On a uh, separate just layer. Just wanted to clarify. And you have clarified it well, my friend. Thank you. All right. We're gonna, the first thing we're going to do is... By the way, this is the last time you'll see Felix on Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, of course. Yeah, we're in the hackers, Dave and Matt. All right, we changed the color to a light brown. I'm going to click OK. Now, we want to change the, uh, the angle of this a little bit. So, actually, and, it, and look, oddly enough, it's changed perfectly to 30, which is wow, right where 30, it's, excellent. See, I can almost will Photoshop to do yeah, what I want to do. If you watched last week's show, uh, it's amazing how all the settings were right where Felix right, wanted exactly. them. Right, <laughs> exactly. All right, so we're going to change the distance to 13. And we're going to change the size to like 18. And just so you can see back, we're just softening the edge of it a little, little bit. Now we're going to go to Bevel and Boss. And I want it to have like a chrome effect or almost like a gold, gold look to it. So the first thing we're going to do is change the depth to like 240. Um, the size, let's make 18. And look, I'm just spitting out random numbers like that. And let's say uh, I'm going to change the, I'm going to click on anti-aliasing and I'm going to change the gloss contour. I'm going to select cone inverted. And then the last thing we're going to do is go to satin. We'll change the color again to like a light brown color. Let's pick something just about in there. Work OK. I'm going to change the distance to 21 and size 70. And once again, I'm going to click in the anti-aliens checkbox, and I'm going to go to the gloss contour and choose ring. The anti-alias, for those of you who don't know what that means, it means that uh, you don't want alias. You want anti-alias. We want anti-alias. No, we're not pro-alias no, at all. Anti-alias, he makes it smoother. All right. So there's what we've got, and I'll zoom in a bit, and you can see it's starting to have that kind of chrome effect to it, a little metallic kinda, look yeah. to it. But we want to take it just a little bit of a step further. So what we're going to do, we can close this off for now. Let's take that layer, and you're going to duplicate it by dragging it into the new layer icon. And we're going to remove the drop shadow from it because we don't want to intensify the shadow too much. Now, I'm going to create, uh, create another layer. I'm going to move it just below the smart object that we, we duplicated, or the layer that we duplicated. Go back to the layer on top and press Command-D just to merge those together. We want to basically try and flatten out the style that we just created and not have it appear as a layer style. Now, we're going to take that layer, we're going to press Command-Shift-U or Control-Shift-U on a PC. Um, and we're going to desaturate the, we're going to remove all the color from it. So it's going to make a grayscale image of that that beveled edge. And once again, I'll zoom in so you guys can kind of see that. It's just a grayscale version of that. Now we're going to take that and you're going to go under Filter, under Artistic, and use Plastic Wrap. Now Plastic Wrap works great when you want stuff to look imperfect, stuff to look shiny. Um, I've never used it to actually make Plastic Wrap, but it works great on other stuff. Um, if you're looking at it, because it adds a bunch of little imperfections and stuff that makes stuff look like, like it's really chrome or, or really metallic looking, as you see what we've got there. So I've got a settings of 20 that I ended for the highlight strength. The detail, I lower it down to 8, and smooth this, I took up to 15. So let's go ahead and hit OK. And then what you'll see is we're going to take that, and we'll zoom in once again so you can see all the little, the little imperfections that it actually added in to the, to the file. And you look, there's before. Doesn't look bad. 
but after it adds all these little imperfections. Now, to get that color back, we want that color, go, uh, color uh, the gold color back to show up, so we're going to take that layer blend mode and put it to overlay. You can see it ah, really intensifies sweet. everything and makes it look nice and, nice and chrome. Right, we're just about done, but we want to do a couple other things to it. Because if we just leave it flat like this, it looks kind of, just looks funky with, it just looks like chrome floating around in the air. So we're going to fill this stuff. pretty good to me. <laughs> no. So we're going to keep going. We're going to add another layer, and we're going to move that layer that we have beneath your original uh, vector layer, or your original, any original layer you have. Now, I've got some paths drawn that I'm just going to select. I'm going to go command click on that first path to load as a selection. I'm going to change the color to a mustard color. And let's move that, let's get it a little bit more orangey looking, something like that. Go ahead and fill that selection, and let's make sure we're on the right layer. Yep, we are. Option delete to fill that selection. Now, I want to fill the ACE wording, the letters ACE, just command click on path 2 to load the selection. I'm going to go ahead and change the color, the foreground color, to a blue. Once again, option delete to fill it, and we'll deselect. Now I want to add a little bit of texture to it because it looks, looks a little flat. Once again, I'll zoom in so you guys can kind of see it. It still just looks a little flat. We're going to go under Filter, choose Texture, and use a Texturizer. And I'll pull up this giant dialog box when it opens up. And we're just going to add some texture to it. And I'm going to pull this over so you can see it. We've actually added, we've chosen Sandstone. We brought the scaling up to 100% and added 4 freely. I think the default is like 2. And just, just, just going to add some definition in there, make it look a little bit, give it like, it just look like it has a little bit more depth. All right, last thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to, I've already got some text in here and added a couple other fills, but that's you go, there you go. That's basically how we did the cover for Photoshop user, the Bootcamp Ace Edition. Sweet. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Nelson. That is excellent. Hey, guys, um, real quick before we jump uh, to our break here, just want to mention, don't forget, what's coming up is something very cool. It's called Photoshop soup to nuts. It's a conference. It's held in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's a great conference. I went to their website here. Their website is Photoshop Soup 2, the number 2, nuts.com. And last week, I liked the way I said it was .org. It's .com, <laughs> but we did fix it in the lower third there. But I want to let you know some of the presenters are going to be at this event. It's a very photography event, uh, or oriented event. But uh, Ben Wilmore, Bruce Frazier, uh, let's see, Jeff Shiwi, Mark Poliger, Mark's uh, top guys. Adobe's like engineer guy, super brain, big giant brain guy, <laughs> big giant brain. Uh, Mike Ninnis is going to be there, uh, myself, Seth Resnick, Terry White, and of course, the man who invented Photoshop, the guy who wrote Photoshop, Thomas Knoll, will be there. It's a really, really great conference. You get a chance to come check it out. I hope to see you there in Ann Arbor. The dates are June 23rd. 23rd and 24th. Go check it out. We're going to take a short break. When I come back, we have a very special guest. Felix Nelson will not be here. Somebody else will be in his place. And that guest is not just like Felix, but special. Like Felix, but special. Stick around. We'll be right back on Adobe Photoshop TV. Stick around. We're back, and I'm Scott Kelby. Joining me is Rich Harrington. Rich is with Red Pixel, and if you've ever been to a Photoshop World Conference, you instantly recognize him. He's always in the video track. He and Rod Harlan basically are the video track, and he is a digital video guru on par with other really good <laughs> digital video gurus. I don't know. But anyway, he is the author of this brand new book called Understanding Adobe Photoshop. And I just took a few looks here, and i got to tell you, I don't understand even one word he wrote. But <laughs> seriously, we brought, <laughs> we brought, you know, this is one of those things where a lot of shows would stop and retake this, wouldn't they? 
Because you okay. know you're a professional digital video guy. It's okay. That's what they normally do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But it's not what we do. So <laughs> one take, Kelby. <laughs> that's because we only have we only only have the studio time for thirty minutes. So gotcha. no matter how bad things get, we roll on. So. <laughs> He's, he's written this book, and uh, a lot of it is in a foreign language. But um, you, you brought us some tips. You got some Photoshop tips, though, right? Exactly. Including a video Photoshop tip. Yep. All Should right. I jump in? Nah, let's, let's talk a little bit more <laughs> about <laughs> understanding Photoshop. <laughs> Absolutely. Go to it. All right. I, I got three tips today. Uh, one, that's on uh, fixing fading, faded historical pictures. So let's uh, just jump in. So one of the things that I encounter a lot of times is I work with uh, documentaries. And often what will happen is we'll get a bunch of pictures in. So this will work if you're doing a documentary for video or if you're doing it for print. And often what happens is you get pictures and they all sort of look a little bit different. Some are gray, some have sepia tones, and I just want to make it nice and consistent. So what I do is I take the picture that most closely matches what I want, and I'll take the eyedropper, uh, shortcuts eye, and just sample um, a color value that's close to the sepia tone. And that's just for reference. Then we can add uh, our first adjustment layer. Uh, in order to get that, we just come to the bottom of the layers palette, click on the little circle here, and you can get your adjustment layers. And we'll pick hue and saturation. And the first step is to just go ahead and strip the color out and get it where you want. Now, obviously, pictures can benefit if you want to do a levels adjustment or anything else. Tweak the picture as you need it. But then the second step is just to add one more hue saturation adjustment layer. So we'll do that, and this time I'll click Colorize. And this allows you to pick a color using the hue slider. And what you basically try to do is you can put these two side by side. You're trying to match this color strip to the initial color you sampled. So you just drag until you get a close match and you just sort of eyeball that. You can adjust the saturation and the lightness. And when you're satisfied with it, then that'll get you pretty close to where you want to be. And that'll give you uh, a consistent sepia tone. Now, when I'm happy there, let's move that in. The nice thing about this is then you could take that adjustment layer and drag it to another image. Okay. There we go. And we put those two side by side, and notice we got a consistent look. And let's just do one more. So here's one more picture. We'll make sure that that's also RGB. And we could take that same adjustment layer and just drag it, drop it over. You get the nice consistency between your pictures. And so that works really well. And then you would just adjust the opacity to taste if you want to knock that down a little bit. But this is a great way to get those pictures all sort of consistent. When you put them next to each other, they look similar. That works very, very well. Yeah. So let's close those out. And uh, I'll give you that video tip right now real quick. And one of the things that people often need to do is create a DVD slideshow. So you know, most people just go ahead and dump all their pictures maybe into iDVD or mm -hmm. Encore. And that's okay. I mean, those programs will scale them down and do everything for you. But you know, when you ask an imaging pro, what's the best imaging program out there? Nobody says iDVD. Right. Photoshop. So why not just let Photoshop do all the work? and size the pictures the right way so they look the best. Okay, this I gotta see. All right, so what you do is in Photoshop, um, this works with CS2. If you don't have CS2, then these actions aren't built in. I've got them documented in the book and people can manually program, but you know, nobody likes to make their own actions for some reason. You wanna bring the actions palette over and under the submenu for the actions palette, there's a new set in CS2, it's called Video Actions. And uh, I wrote these actually with Dan Brown. It's right at the bottom of the list. Let's see if we can get that to fit on screen there. It's just off screen. It's at the bottom of your yeah, list. It's <laughs> pretend it's there. Pretend it's there. It's at the bottom. And uh, that'll load your video actions in. And the one that we're going to use, we've got a couple ones here. You've got um, NTSC or PAL. So if you're over in Europe, you're going to use PAL. If you're here in the U.S. or Japan uh, or in Canada, yeah, of course, Canada. In Canada, of course. Yeah, you're going to use NTSC, which is the the size that we use. And you got two types. You got widescreen or standard. So obviously, if you're doing a 16 by 9 or a regular 4 by 3 show, and then you have that choice. You know, when you put something up on TV, how sometimes it cuts off the edges, like the outer edges of the TV get cut off a little bit. So if you want your pictures to be seen entirely on the screen, choose inset. If you want them to just fill the whole frame up as much as possible, choose standard. Then all you have to do is use the good old um, Matt's favorite thing, I suspect, probably the image processor or at least the scripts menu. Yep. And uh, you're going to just pick the folder that you want. So under image processor, you choose a folder to use. 
we'll just say select this folder and I'll go to the drive and here it is. I'll just pick this one. I'll hit choose. And these are all actually JPEGs and JPEGs are bad for video because JPEGs have compression. You put them in with video compression, they look really bad on screen. So hit choose. And then we could say, oh, okay, I got a folder, great. And then we can choose to put them in a new destination if we want. So I'll just put them out on the desktop and we'll make a new folder called Slideshow. There we go. Hit choose. And then we'll save those as TIFFs and we'll choose to run an action. So I'll just pick the video action set, so right there, and then we'll pick the action from here, we'll just say DVD slideshow. It's in the list, you just pick it. And then it's all set, you just double check things. Yep, it's pulling from here, it's going here. Save them as TIFFs, run that action. And we hit go, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna open up each file, and here's our first gotcha, uh-oh. It's giving us a stop, we don't like stops on actions. Well, that's because these actions have stops in them, and what that's doing is it's telling us what the action does. So let's clear that out. We'll just get rid of the stop, run action, video actions, and we just pick that DVD slideshow. At this point, you'd walk away from your system from a little bit, get a drink of your choice, and when you come back... Get an adult <laughs> beverage. <laughs> Tasty. Uh, it, it basically is sizing the pictures down. So it'll either letterbox them or pillar box them um, by putting black on the sides of the tops, and it converts them to the right size for video. It makes them so they drop right in. And so when you're in your DVD program, you make a slideshow and you hit build, your DVD slideshow will be built and ready to go in like 30 seconds because it doesn't have to process all the images. Everything's already done. So it's just going right along and dropping them in that destination folder. That is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> but there's no real end to this, is there? It just kind of goes and goes, oh, there's the end. Yeah. There it is. It's, yeah. They're in a folder. Yep, they're all done. All right, now, tell us about your book, the one they called Understanding Adobe Photoshop, because... I need to understand. I'm sure you do. It'd come in healthy for your job. It really possession. would. Uh, understanding Adobe Photoshop is based on uh, my years of teaching Photoshop at a college level. So it addresses video, but I, what I try to do is I decided there was a need for a Photoshop book that was a college classroom in a book. Uh, you know, we have classroom in a book, but I wanted to take college classroom in a book. So ah. it's, uh, it so covers... It's lots of big words. Lots of big lots words, of yes. And words. you pay exorbitant fees. No. <laughs> um, basically, I try to capture the classroom experience. So it talks about, and it starts by teaching about pixels and where do images come from, and then it moves through all the skills that I found my students needed to get those entry-level jobs. And then in later chapters, it talks about things like portfolios and understanding image rights. So it really takes you through the whole process of moving into the field. And then we stocked it with um, interactive quizzes for each chapter. And it has DVDs, right? Yep, with it? four and a half hours of training video. So, and 220-some uh, hands-on exercises. Amazing. Well, thank you, Rich, for being here. Sure. Uh, that's uh, Rich Harrington from Red Pixel. And where can they learn more about you? What website can they go to? Uh, Red Pixels, R H E D P I X E L dot com. Everything's there. We've got a great area called Resources with conference handouts and lots of free stuff. And I have Photoshop for video as well with other free stuff. Very cool. Well, I want you to hang out for a second because sure. I'm going to show you something that you may not even know about. Good. Because it's so cool and so hidden. Last week you weren't here on the show. Felix was here in your place. Uh, and um, we looked at using uh, the Photoshop bridge to access the Photoshop services. Do you use the Photoshop services at all? Like the online printing? Yes. I've looked at it. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> he's looked at it, but he's never used it. That's why I'm here. All right, I want to show you, because online printing is one part, but there's many other cool, cool things. So I'm going to show you one of those cool things now. And uh, the cool thing I'm going to show you is, it's called Photoshop services, and let me just get it all fired up here. Uh, it starts from the bridge, so you have to have Photoshop CS2. All right, all right. So, so here we are in the bridge, and it's, more shots of baby Kira. Baby! There's a little foot. All kind of crazy baby. All right. So what we're going to do this week is we're going to go and select all of the photos because we're going to go to the tools menu under Photoshop services, but this time we're going to go and create a photo book. These are hardcover books, and the whole thing is just amazingly easy to do. You just choose photo books, and once you've selected the photos, of course, that's first. Now, they want 20 photos. I have only selected 12, so, of course, the first thing it's going to tell me is, well, you've only selected 12 photos. You're insufficient. Right, but this is only a half-hour TV show, so we're going to pretend that I uploaded 20, but we're only uploading 12. So, it's loading here now. 
internet speeds may vary. There we go. Internet speeds may vary. And it's going to load your photos. You're going to see a, a, a uh, internet speeds may vary. You're going to see a little uh, display of the photos that you've uploaded here and say, there they are. Very, very small thumbnails. Of course, you can select more photos, and that's what it's trying to prompt me to do. It's going, well, you've only selected 12 photos. You need a minimum of 20. So for everyone at home, start with 20 photos. Then go here, we're going to click the next button. Let's, I'll move this up a little so you can actually see the next button. I can see that was not a, that was not a good move. <laughs> Scroll down. There we go. There's the next button. Hit the next button just as quick as you can while we're connected to the Internet. And it's going to take you to the next page. That's in the same space where my actions menu was. Yes, there it is. All right, so it's, it asks you to sign in. Of course, I am signed in as me. I am me. So I'm already, I've already logged myself in. But uh, what we're going to do is, again, we're building a very, very cool, um, and here it's, up, it's uploading the photos right now as we speak. What we're going to build is a hardcover book. Now, these are actually hardcover books. They're uh, actually printed, of course, by Kodak. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to need to do is choose the layout. Now, it's going to in, in the next step, there's an, an autofill option where it basically lets you just autofill the photos the way it'll throw them all in, into whatever order you want. Like a one-click designer. Like a one-click designer, but, it, but I've learned that although it is a good starting place, it never quite throws the photos exactly where you want it because as cool as this is, it doesn't read your mind. So you're going to have a chance, though, to create and put them in the order that you want. You get to choose different layouts. You get to choose different book covers, and you're going to see the whole thing in just a minute. All right, once they're uploaded, you'll get this little screen here that says, Congratulations, your photos have been successfully uploaded. When you click the Next button, which is cleverly located right off screen, here we go. You'll get to this screen right here to launch your web browser. And the first thing you get to choose, of course, here is uh, what kind of, you know, do you want the leather cover, the linen cover, the smooth, and the different prices are here. We're going to go with the rich, fine Corinthian leather cover. Then you're going to hit the next button, and it's going to take you to the next page. <laughs> Surprising, right? And this is where you get to decide, well, what kind of printing that you want, single-sided or double-sided. And they have, of course, all kinds of themes. And for this one, of course, we're going to choose baby girl. But uh, there are, some of the themes are very, very cool. We're going to hit the next button. And then it's going to ask you, this little thing pops up and says, do you want to autofill your book or do you want to do it manually page by page? So we're going to go ahead and choose autofill. And it's going to drop the, you can see what it's doing here. Here's the album that we chose them from. And you can choose the different layouts. Do you want one up or two up or, or four up, something like that, whatever you want to decide to do. And click next. One moment, please. And it's loading. You can't see there's a little status bar just below the screen saying loading. And then it gives you these little previews of your page. This is the inside cover template. So what it's showing you is this actually shows through the cover. It's got a cutout in the middle of it, and you're going to see this on the inside. And it just lets you go through here and build the book. And down here, there's a little scroll bar to look at your different pictures and build the book that your way you want. You can choose different page layouts. And, of course, this is the inside cover. You can go to, there's a dedication page. We'll go to pages two and three, and you can drag and drop photos there. Or, in this case, you see it just auto-filled. So it's, it, you can completely customize the whole thing, add your own uh, captions. And when you finally get to the, to the end where you've chosen it the way you want it, you go to the next page and you've clicked OK, it will basically ship it to you. Now, right now, it's going to keep auto-filling pages till the cows come home. I'm not going to make you sit through that because, well, we only have 12 pages, 12 photos, and at some point, they're baby pictures. They are baby pictures, and they're so cute. Baby! Okay, so anyway, um, but that's a very cool thing. A lot of people know about those. Even Rich Harrington didn't really know about those. So it's a very, very cool thing. Go check those out. There's a lot of neat things under the service that a lot of people don't know about. Of course, we'll look at some more in the future. But for now, we're going to take a quick break. So stick around. We'll be right back. And we'll have Felix Nelson back with us to wrap up the show. Special thanks to Rich Harrington for being here and hanging out with us. And we'll be right back on Adobe Photoshop TV. Stick around. back and hey if you've been asking yourself 
how can I see Photoshop TV on TV? We actually have a great way for you to do that. And you, you heard us talk about one of our sponsors, DLO. Well, one of the coolest things about DLO, besides the fact that they're our sponsor, which is, believe me, very, very cool, is that this thing right here. I have one of these myself. It's called the DLO Home Doc Deluxe. What it lets you do is watch your your video podcasts on your regular TV. Here what we have is what to call a regular TV. It's got a little remote function here, and of course you can watch, listen to your, you know, your iPod stuff and go through different playlists and stuff like that. You know, you can do all that stuff here using a little remote. Why I'm aiming at the TV, I have no idea because <laughs> this is what you aim at. There we go, that works a little better. But you can do all your on-screen stuff here. But if you want to watch TV, what you do is just come to your iPod, choose like what you want to watch. I'm going to watch, uh, video. There's a little button here that switches you to iPod mode. So we're going to choose videos. We're going to choose my video podcasts, Photoshop TV. We're going to watch episode 27. You hit play and it just goes. Once it's playing, you can do all your changes from the remote here. And you'll see here in a second, there it is. Photoshop TV is on the air and you can fast forward and stuff. So we'll just fast forward because this part is really boring. There we go. Look, it's Photoshop TV. We'll hit little play button. There it is. That's me talking, and then here I'm talking. It's like the magic of TV. Anyway, this is called the DLO Home Doc, and uh, this is it right here, the DLO Home Doc Deluxe. So check it out wherever find DLO stuff, or you can go to their website, DLO.com. All right, we're going to throw things. Hold on. Before we throw things, we're going to pause this. God, those guys are so annoying. We're going to throw things over to Matt Kloskowski with his interview from Adobe Systems, he got to pull a uh, part of the Photoshop team together and ask him a couple of questions, and uh, we're going to throw things over to Mr. Klaskowski, as he really has a great interview with them. Stick around. Here's Matt. All right, so uh, I am here at Adobe Systems with uh, some of the, the main people from Photoshop. Uh, right here, we've got John Knack, and John is the product manager for Photoshop. Well, I'm sorry. A product manager. A I don't product. want to take excessive <laughs> All of credit. There are like 300 of us. So. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, John is a product manager for Photoshop. I've got Scott Beyer, who is a architect for Photoshop, and uh, Russell Williams, who is, is the, other, the other architect for Photoshop. So uh, I was able to pull these guys away from work for a little while and just uh, talk a little bit about uh, you know, the Photoshop world and what's going on. So I guess I, I was going to start off with a lot of people ask us about you know, the whole macromedia merger and what's going on, what's that mean to Photoshop and, and, and the program in general. Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, what's your guys' feelings? What's, what's changed in your life as far as now that you've got macromedia in-house here? Well, I, I think for Photoshop uh, itself, n not a lot has changed really directly. Um, it's more um, a question of how do we make Photoshop files in particular integrate better with some of the other tools out there. That's been a big request. We definitely have some ideas, as these guys know, I'm always bringing up some sort of left field stuff about how we could leverage some of the macromedia technology more throughout our apps. But really, I think what people would like is just to keep working in Photoshop, but to have a freer way of getting that stuff into other tools downstream, Flash, Flex, uh, Dreamweaver. And so those are the kind of things that we've always known people wanted. But we never really had the tools uh, or, the, or the communication mm. as separate companies to get that stuff done. So I think, you know, in the near term, we'll just see a lot of really kind of basic but really, really impactful welcome changes. Cool. So, and I've got to ask this one. What's a day in the life of somebody that works on Photoshop like? I know there's people out there that want to know. I mean, you know, it, and it, it's probably, the answer is probably a lot like everybody who wants to know what their day is like. It's, Probably very probably, similar. You come probably probably pretty similar. Yeah. yeah. I don't email. Know. <laughs> email. Email. That's the first thing you do when you come in. Enormous amounts of email. My guess is, is people think you guys, you know, you guys get around a table in the morning and say, okay, what are we going to do in Photoshop today? And yeah. I don't know that that happens. Well, you know, it's it's the whole um, one one percent inspiration, ninety nine percent perspiration thing, mm -hmm. and we've definitely got a lot of inspiration, and then we just need to map that into the perspiration, and so. The getting around a table generally has to deal with, okay, we know what we need to do. How do we do it just step by step, week by week? Week by week, definitely trying to get game plans put together, um, you know, in our... Whoa. Oh, okay, the light went off. So hopefully it'll come back if you guys wave your arms. Everybody no. wave. Yeah. 
<laughs> we'll probably edit this out. Hang on. There we go. There there we go. go. So just, just to prove the point, Adobe is trying to be ecologically friendly. <laughs> this is supposedly uh, one of the best buildings in the country. It's okay. one of the cool things about working here. Is okay. This is a you know an extremely efficient building. I, I just I think that's really cool, especially for you know a company where there's four or five computers plugged into the wall yeah. in every office. <laughs> and that it's still a green a green yeah. building. But yeah, some of these guys' offices, you walk in and uh, you got to take off your sweater. There's just you know, <laughs> like from the monitor. fifteen different uh, CPUs. Going, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so uh, so from the architect perspective, when a version of Photoshop comes out, is that pretty much? It, do you just flip, stop, and flip gears to okay? Now we have to start thinking of the next version, or are you still kind of become more and more of a continual process. Um, so it was a couple of releases back where we started going into a lot more early planning and um, you know paying attention to what was going on with the previous version and try and hit the ground running as we as we flip the versions mm -hmm. yeah we, we pay attention to what's going on on the uh, with the uh, testers and on the Adobe forums and we're discussing we're always discussing sort of what's coming up next one of the things we, we've started doing across Adobe is coming up with uh, three cycle product plans where we plan sort of uh, what what directions we're going to be taking in the next version and the next version and whenever we produce a feature we're also looking at well is this just a feature or is this um, uh, something we're going to do more with like obviously smart objects are a very mm -hmm. powerful feature and possible foundation for a lot more stuff layer, like layers were before mm -hmm. them. Very cool. Now, you mentioned something about the forums. Now, I think that's pretty cool. You guys actually visit and frequent the forums in our, Adobe in our, copious, <laughs> in our copious free time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I definitely try and, and get through them uh, with a reasonable frequency just to see what the, what the rumblings on the ground are. And, and I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, that I, people are hitting. I, I'd venture to say a lot of software companies can't say that the, you know, the people building the product are actually out there. I, I think it's important because otherwise you get into that you know the old telephone game where the information just gets filtered through so many mediums that the the original complaint loses its impact. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing that's cool about working on Photoshop um, that I think is a real advantage for this team is that, uh, especially now with digital photography, a lot of the people on the team are really passionate users in their spare time. You know, uh, I know Russell's always. Uh, making really large format inkjet prints, and it's that process that really gets you acquainted with pain points. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, did you try to set up the the color profile? Did you have some problem when you know the ink stock changed or the paper stock rather? And you know, if it if it weren't for people doing the work themselves, I think things wouldn't have the same impact. So, oh, yeah. so we're in a really a nice position because it's something where, you know, I. I came here to myself to build the tool that I wanted to use. Whenever you know it, the time comes that I'm not at Adobe anymore, I'm still going to be using Photoshop, and I'm still going to be geeking out in the evening and <laughs> writing emails and being on forums. And um, now it's contest time. First, let's look at the winner of last week's question. The question last week was. What is this dialog box? Where did it come from? What's it called? And of course, the answer is it is the custom dialog yeah, box where you box make your you'll own. You'll never find anywhere. You'll probably never yeah, use you'll never it, but find, it's you'll there. Never use it, but it's good to know it's there. It's for making up your own custom filters. Who knows how it works? I certainly don't. I bet Dave Cross knows that. That's the same. Matt. Matt knows. Matt, yeah, one of those Matt guys, knows everything. Yeah, those guys. One of those guys <laughs> would know, certainly, but I have no idea. Uh, so that brings us to this week's question. Uh, first, what would you win? Well, first you could win this brand new, the Best of Photoshop TV. It's a DVD, uh, and it is basically all of the best of our first six months. All the good snippets, all, all the bad stuff is gone. All, all the, the good bad stuff's, stuff's good. It's just tutorial, 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 and some silly outtakes. But other than that, it's just nonstop action. So if you don't win it, you can, of course, find it at photoshopvideos.com. And uh, a copy of my channel's book, the Photoshop channel's book, and uh, that's available wherever fine books are sold. Also, a copy of Layers Magazine, a one-year subscription to Layers Magazine. We're going to throw in two more books that aren't here. One is the Photoshop CS2 Killer Tips book written by myself right. and Mr. Nelson. And Rich Harrington was kind enough to offer his book as well 
understanding Photoshop. Ooh, bonus Ooh, gifts. Bonus gifts. You're gonna win all five of those. You do not have to be in the United States to win those. You can be anywhere. We'll ship them anywhere. We don't care because obviously we have big shipping bills. So what does is, what is one more matter? So anywhere you are, we're happy to send it to you if you win. Now this week's question is, what's missing from this dialog box that you see on screen right there? What's missing from this dialog box? If you have the answer, go to PhotoshopTV.com, where our website and blog are. You'll see a little link on the, I think it's on the right side, that says Enter Contest. And from the entries, we will be able to pick one winner that gets this whole thing. doesn't matter where now, you are in let, the world. Can I let them enter as many as they want again, or is that bad again? No, no. no. Just, just one time. Enter just one, one time. time. <laughs> Last week, Felix wanted to let everyone enter as many times as just possible. Just wanted to give a lot of love. No, nope, he wanted to do that. All right. Now, we like to end each show by giving you three things to do between this week's show and next week's show. First thing I'm going to send you to do is a very, very, very cool digital photography workflow seminar. It's from, it's from D65, the D65 workshops. They're run by Seth Resnick, who's a very, very world-famous Photoshop guru, printing expert, and uh, really is great with the digital workflow, and an incredible photographer. Uh, he's coming up to, I have these written down here, he's coming to Philly next on uh, the 9th. He's going to be in Salt Lake City, San Francisco, Chicago, New York City, go check it out at D60, I believe it's d-65.com. But if I'm wrong about the web address, I believe a lower thirds will appear right now <laughs> with the correct web address. All right, what do you got, Felix? And if you can't get enough Photoshop training, you can go to uh, photoshoptraining.com. And actually, Scott has a new online course there. Oh. It's uh, Photoshop for Digital Photographers. It's a 21-day course. Uh, you can take it at your leisure. Take it, at, you know, you download a day at a time. It's got all kind of great stuff on there. It's just, it's a great way to learn Photoshop. Kind of at your own pace. You Once come again, back on this show Photoshop anytime training. you want. <laughs> you come back. Felix Nelson, come back anytime you want. That's a wonderful to I, do. I love being You're a good man. Hey, lastly, uh, the Photoshop World class schedule is now online. So if you're thinking about going to Photoshop World in Las Vegas, and I hope that you do, of course, the classes and the instructor roster are all up live and registration is wide open. Hundreds of people have already signed up. Right. And it's still not till September 7th through 9th, so it's going to be a huge show. It's in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay Convention Center. We are going to have a blast. Of course, we'll be doing Photoshop live from there. Right. Felix Nelson will be there. Of course, Dave Cross, Matt Klaskowski, and all of the big names in the Photoshop will be there. We hope that you'll join us. It's going to be absolutely a blast. For more info, go to photoshopworld.com. Well, guys, that's it for this episode. I want to thank my good friend, Mr. Felix Nelson. You're welcome. For Thanks, here. guys, for having me here. And, uh, of course, next week we'll be back in the studio with Matt and Dave. They'll be yeah, back he'll be out of trip. jail by then. Dave should be out of jail. And, yeah, oh, Dave will have yeah, bit we'll... that, beat that visa wrap. Right, right. And uh, Matt, of course, will be released as well. So thank you guys for watching so much. Thanks to all of our sponsors. And we'll see you guys next week right here on Adobe Photoshop TV. Thanks for watching. Adobe Photoshop TV. See you next week.